Well, here we are in Nebraska. We can't see it, but history is totally enmeshed in this place. In my mind's eye, I can see and picture the wagon trains that came through here so long ago. Over 250,000 westward immigrants passed by Scotts Bluff between 1843 and 1869. This is part of the Oregon Trail used by folks who left their homes back east to move to Oregon and California. Hello, welcome to this episode of History Hunters. We're in Nebraska, Scotts Bluff to be specific. We're here to check out what used to be the Oregon Trail that went right through these two bluffs. If this looks familiar, it probably should. This was like one of the second landmarks that the pioneers traveling on the Oregon Trail looked for. They initially had a pass right through here. I believe starting in the 1850s, the fur trappers and settlers that were going out west made a path right through here. And there's a couple of wagons out here to kind of reconstruct uh, things. It's hard to believe that this is actually the Oregon Trail passing between these two rather distinctive cliffs. If you can imagine, just a long period of time, thousands of travelers from the east would travel across these grasslands right here in search of a better land. Many of you have watched the movie 1883 with Sam Elliott and Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. This would have been the area those types of people would have traveled. I have seen pictures of this place for a long time and always wanted to come here. It's actually 93 degrees today, so it's very hot. Here's an actual wagon. You can see the pioneers would have used something like this to come out west, pulled by oxen team. Of course, this is a reconstruction. And of course, those are, I guess they're fiberglass bulls. Could you have done this back in the day? If I didn't have a choice, <laughs> I mean, I mean, some of these people were traveling for like four or five, six months. You do what I want to? Not like that. <laughs> I think this is the same ground they would have walked on. The Monument's North Bluff is named after Hiram Scott, a clerk for the Rocky Mountain Fur Company who died near the bluff in 1828. The bluff served as an important landmark on the Oregon Trail, California Trail, and Pony Express Trail, and was visible at a distance from the Mormon Trail. It was the second most referred to landmark on the Immigrants Trail in pioneer journals and diaries. There is a visitor center back there that we're going to go check out as well. Kind of cast some more work on the walls and tells about how the settlers came out west through this area of Nebraska. There were several geological formations that the pioneers would actually look for to make sure that they were on the right course. Chimney Rock, which is east of here, was one of them. Independence Rock was one of them. We're not going to be able to visit Independence Rock on this trip, but Independence Rock was this giant rock that they had to reach by the 4th of July, hence they called it the Independence Rock. They had to reach it by 4th of July if they wanted to make the Sierra Nevadas into the Central Valley of California, into California before the winter snores, snows came. Of course, you know what happened to the Donner Party when they entered the Sierra Nevadas too late. The season was late October. Early snowfalls started happening, and then the Donner Party got trapped in the mountains, and they starved to death, a lot of them. At least half the party, for about 43 of the 80-plus people in the Donner Party perished. This path here was the Oregon Trail path that went farther north. It's not believed that the Donner Party passed this way in June 1846. The common route at that time was north of the Platte River, as outlined in this map that shows the path steering to the north of Scotts Bluff. From there, the party reached Fort Laramie and then the ill-fated Hastings Cutoff in Utah. Although a natural gap existed between South Bluff and Scotts Bluff, the area was not easily traveled. So initially, the Oregon Trail passed to the south of the Scotts Bluff area at Rubidoux Pass, and the Mormon Trail passed to the north of the bluff 
on the other side of the North Platte River. In the early 1850s, a road was constructed in the Gap, which later became known as Mitchell Pass. Beginning in 1851, this new passage became the preferred route of the Oregon and California trails, although the Mormon Trail continued to pass the bluff only at a distance. Just who built the road through Mitchell Pass about 1850 is unknown, although one possibility includes soldiers from Fort Laramie. Use of the Immigrant Trail tapered off in 1869 after the trail was superseded by the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. By the 1840s, migrants traveling to Oregon and California encountered multiple dangers. Crossing the North Platte River was dangerous, and so were the sudden and violent prairie storms. To make the land seem more hospitable, they named rock formations for familiar symbols like courthouse, jail, and chimney. There's a little sign here I'm going to read for you. It talks about this being a transportation corridor that moved traffic between east and west along the trails. Most history books focus on the westward travel along the trails, but what about the eastward movement? The first European Americans to record seeing the bluffs were eastbound fur traders returning from the west coast. After that, the fur traders traveled both ways to trap, trade, and attended rendezvous. Once wagons traversed the trail, the reason to travel along it multiplied with vast numbers of people moving west looking for land, riches, and religious freedom. The number of people who turned around is unknown. Motives for turning to their starting points varied with the people. Some saw an elephant and quit in the midst of their westward journey. Hardships, deaths, and realization that this was not what they wanted were all reasons to become go-backers or turn around. Other people made it to their destination and found it was not for them. Some returned for goods and others came back only long enough to bring their family members to the west. Traders drove massive freight wagons both ways on the trail. Army units also rode the trail east and west as they searched for problems along the route. The short-lived Pony Express galloped each direction as they traveled mail between St. Joseph, Missouri and San Francisco, California. This dry grass crunching under my feet would have been what they traveled on. Now, if anybody knows what kind of plant this is, I would love it if you love to comment below so we could see. I mean, I'm sure these were growing back in the 1850s, way long ago. It must look like some kind of yucca plant. I see the shadow of birds, maybe some hawks flying high above that ridge. We're going to assume that the trail was right through here. Of course, now it's been paved with asphalt. I'm going to see if I can possibly stick my camera in here and show you what the inside of this Conestoga wagon looked like. Even though this obvious reproduction of the hitch. There we go. Very basic wagon. Imagine your family having to travel across the country in that thing. Maybe kept your supplies right there. Those wagon wheels were very important. In fact, you had to, you know, if you were traveling across the country, you had to learn how to fix those wagon wheels. One of the Donners, I think it was George Donner, when he was going out west, he had uh, an accident with his buggy and he was trying to fix it. He actually cut his hand with an ax and it brought about some great problems. In fact, it led to his death. Another smaller wagon here. Now, if you want to come out here, it's a national landmark or a national monument. They don't charge to come here, but uh, it's way out of the way. So it took us quite a while to get here from Cheyenne, Wyoming. The inside of the museum has a lot of displays, some that offer a tangible connection to folks who wandered through this land so long ago. One such display was that of this rusty 1849 Colt pocket revolver that was unearthed from the ground in 1906. Then there is this collection of rusty Jews harps used to make merriment around the campfires as families relax for the evening. Early travelers were often guilty of their own brand of graffiti, carving their names into soft rock to leave behind a record of who and when they came through. One was left by William Weber of Niles, Michigan, who left his mark on May 23, 1852. The stone that he carved was cut from the rock and placed here on display. One display cleverly used the canvas of a mock wagon to present a quote from the 1857 diary of a traveler named Helen McCowan Carpenter that read, July 28, 
We corralled last night opposite the most splendid scenery we have met with on our travels. They are sand hills intermixed with rock or a hard substance resembling rock that rise and tower over the other like splendid mansions with numerous chimneys rising to a great height. They are called Scott's Bluff. Then there's this 1853 quote from Isaac Mossman, the buffalo which crossed our tracks at intervals in herds of thousands, sounding like distant thunder as they rushed on with tremendous speed. This display notes that the Indians followed herds of buffalo through this area. Overhunting of buffalo herds, overland migration, the whiskey trade, disease, warfare, and federal removal efforts combined to decimate and displace the region's native population over the course of the 1800s. So I hope you appreciated this very brief visit to Scott's Bluff, Nebraska. I hope you equally appreciate what the pioneers used to go through before the Transcontinental Railroad enabled people to travel with much greater ease from coast to coast and bring the supplies that they needed to build and such forth. But again, we're talking people who started migrating out here uh, in the 1840s and 1850s. This pass here was probably in heaviest use in the 1850s. Mm -hmm.